Great, thank you for coming out this afternoon. Uh, my name is Marshall Tappan. I'm from Amazon Fulfillment Technologies. Uh, we're not part of AWS. We are part of the retail side of the business. Our organization operates and develops the software that runs Amazon's fulfillment centers that ship all the boxes, especially at this time of year. Uh, so today, uh, so I'm a principal applied scientist in computer vision. I spent a number of years in academia before joining Amazon. And today what we'll be talking about is how we're using computer vision inside our processes in Amazon fulfillment technologies, inside our fulfillment centers to, to make our processes more efficient and to solve tasks that we, that we are natural to be handled with computer vision. Uh, so what I'm going to walk today is walk through a particular instance of how we combined uh, traditional computer vision with deep learning to, to automate the process of lo locating mistakes um, in, in our fulfillment centers where people make mistakes and, and things go missing. And then at the end, I'd really like to talk about kind of Focus, starting with this basic example, then kind of looking at the broader issue of with the rapid progress that the advent of deep learning has brought to recognition, especially visual recognition and computer vision, what are the best ways to tap into this, uh, this technology and, and how do we harness the power, the power of it? So we kind of talk broadly about that at, at the end of the talk. So now the issue that we were confronted with is we have these pods, and these pods have these things we call bins, and all the objects are stored in bins. Now one of the things that you need to understand about how we operate our fulfillment centers is, is that those bins uh, are filled with a, with a technique we call a random stow. That means a bin can hold anything, right? There's not, there's not an overall storage mechanism. If you looked in those bins carefully as you're watching the video, they were a sort of, a sort of random item. So this is a picture of an of a actual bin from an Amazon fulfillment center. And you notice there's just kind of random stuff in there. We don't allocate bins, maybe you would think in an organized way, such as, well, this bin is the bin of Harry Potter books, and this bin is the bin of Malibu Barbies, and this bin is the bin of Matchbox cars. Right? What we found is for both a space utilization and also for efficiency of running our operations is that when we're putting items into the fulfillment center, the rule is, now there's some etiquette, but generally you put the item the first place you find space for it. And just kind of the same way that randomized algorithms work in computer science, this ends up with giving us a much more efficient system that, that, produce, that, that lets us use the space in the fulfillment center optimally and also avoids a lot of uh, degenerate cases where things are kind of stuck in one, in one part. Now, the, now Renosto so is great from an efficiency standpoint, but there's one downside or one weakness that it has, which is if inventory is misplaced or somehow handled incorrectly, it effectively disappears. Right? Harry Potter books don't have a specific place to go to in a fulfillment center. Or a box of Lego, there's not a Lego corner of the fulfillment center. So if, so if it goes missing, it's gone. So here's an example of something that happened. This is, we, we, we captured on photos. Here, uh, the, there is a speaker system, a Sonos speaker system down there on the left that the associate was supposed to take. Um, but he couldn't quite get it out. So he grabbed the Lego and said, oh, there's some space up here. So he grabbed those Lego boxes and moved them up there just to, to make space and then forgot to put them back. And the problem is when you have a random stow system where you're just using the database to keep track of where everything's at, those two Lego boxes have now disappeared. In this case, we're lucky they're pretty close, but you can't really rely on that. And also, we think about these systems run at scale, say at, at Christmas time, you know, the, the accumulated entropy starts, these items makes it impossible to find things. And so we call this an inventory defect. And what that means is, is that our virtual inventory that we're keeping track of the database now no longer matches the physical inventory that we're actually seeing in that, in that bin. And it's not just people misplacing things. As you notice, those pods are driving all over the place, and things fall out. So uh, with our cameras, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, we actually caught something in midair fall falling out of the pod. Uh, here's another example uh, of something falling out of the pod. So this is a real problem. And if we don't keep control of it, pretty soon we can't find anything in the warehouse, and it makes it very difficult for us to fulfill orders in a timely, efficient fashion. And you know, as you see, as, as we progress from two-day shipping to one-day shipping, now we have two-hour shipping in the Prime Now program. It's very important that we be able to find things. And so, we, so as we started this project, we looked at this, and this was a, a large problem. And we kind of looked at it and said, was this an area where we could apply computer vision? Can we apply computer vision to find instances of places where things are being misplaced, things are falling, so that we can direct people then to go rectify those problems very quickly and very efficiently? And so when we looked at this problem, we wanted, to, we wanted to come up with a computer vision solution. And the first problem we addressed was, how do we get imagery? Right? You're not going to be able to use computer vision if you don't have images. So what we did then is we kind of looked at this. And this is kind of a schematic of how those stations work where those pods drive up to. They typically will kind of line up in the station in the queue. And there's a person at that station kind of uh, either loading or unloading things. And so we started by saying, well, 
what we can do is we can stick two cameras in there. We can stick a camera that captures those pods as they roll up to the station, and then we can stick a second camera that, in there that, that photographs the pods as they leave. And so when we built it, this is what it looks like. The pod will roll up to that station. What you see there is a, the white things are a, a set of three lights. They're LED uh, backlit lights and, and three um, industrial cameras. We need three cameras to be able to capture the whole height of the pod. And those capture three photos. And I'll show you, uh, you'll see a lot of pictures of pods in the next few slides uh, in more detail. Then the pod will then go on to the station. The associate will interact with it. However, either pick an item, stone item, whatever task he needs to do. And then on the way out, we grab, we grab a second photo of it so that we can kind of get a before and after comparison if that's helpful. And so, so, we, so we said, okay, that's great. We've got imagery now. And the great thing about the system was, was we were able to stick those cameras in there in a way that we didn't really have to interfere with the process of the fulfillment center. We didn't have to really change their workflow very much, which is crucial to kind of making this work from a business standpoint because we really don't want to slow them down, especially during critical times like, like the holiday season. And so, so then we ha we, now we have this flood of imagery coming in. You can imagine as, as, as these images are, are, as, are being, as these uh, pods are moving in the stations, we're gathering images like crazy. And so we then had to come up with a computer vision strategy. And so we had to, what we wanted to do is we knew deep learning was going to work, but the problem was the cameras were giving us imagery coming in just at the pod level, right? So that, a pod is those big, like big uh, fabric yellow shells, and it's divided into individual bins. But really the database works at a bin level, because that's the granularity that we're operating with from, a, from, a, uh, from an inventory standpoint. So we need to be able to take those, giant, those large images of, of complete pods and get down to the bin level, right? So we ended up the system that both combined kind of traditional computer vision and, and deep learning. And so we have a two-step process. The first process is we're going to look at these bin images, and the next process, or look at these images of a pod, excuse me, and then we'll break those into individual bins and then go ahead and start analyzing that, looking for mistakes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk generally about the broad computer vision, how we solve that problem, and then we'll get into, the, into the, how we actually analyze, analyze the bin images. So um, this is, an, this is uh, the center image from one of those cameras. So this was taken from that middle camera of the three cameras. And what you see is, is the, the pod here. Is it's, and the labels underneath describe each, describe each individual bin. And so our goal then is to take that pod image and break it down into, into individual bin images that we can actually say, OK, this image is bin you know, 35628. All right, so that we can then analyze that, reason about that, and correlate that with our, with our inventory systems. So the initial problem was, the initial thought we thought was less fine, we got these barcodes, you know, that should be pretty easy. Uh, the minute you start doing computer vision in any problem, you'll find out that Murphy's Law is a real thing. Especially in a busy uh, industrial environment like, like a fulfillment center, anything that can possibly go wrong will go wrong actually pretty regularly. Right, so we looked at these barcodes, we said, okay, that's no problem, the barcodes will tell us everything you need to know, it'll be cakewalk, until we realized they had put these elastic bands up in front there and they were now obscuring the barcodes. And on a lot of these things, we could no longer actually reliably read the barcodes because the, uh, the elastic bands were, were, were obscuring them. So we had to step back and say, okay, how can we solve this problem? And I think one of the things that we realized on this is that there's just no replacement for having access to sophisticated computer vision systems, right? Because even problems that seem trivial, when you have to run them at scale and you have to run them, um, you know, over, over millions of instances, you really, you, what you see is the tail of the things that could go wrong becomes significant enough that you really have to very quickly increase the sophistication of your systems in order to keep up. So, we looked and said, well, okay, we can't rely on detecting the barcodes, so what are we going to do? Well, you know, those big yellow trays are pretty obvious, so why don't we, if we can, if we can, detect, if we can detect those, and then we can detect the sides there, which have highlighted yellow, right? What we then have is a set of physical key points on these pods then that we can then correlate, and we know exactly where we can, we have these kind of physical key points we can correlate with a database that has a, a, phys, a kind of a physical recipe of what that geometry of the front side of the pod should look like. And so if we can find those kind of key intersections between the bars there, we can then go ahead and map that to the database, and that's going to tell us very precisely where those bins are at. So to do that then, in this case, we were able to uh, make it work with, with, um, with kind of a hand-engineered system. So this part at the, initially was hand-engineered. We're now looking at using machine learning to uh, make it more reliable and robust. 
But initially, we'll start with a fairly high resolution image. So uh, we'll go, we'll start with a 2K by 2K image. We'll downsample that for sufficiency and convert to grayscale. In this case, the, the color didn't prove to be necessary. So that, that really bought us a lot of processing efficiency. Um, then we'll start doing something known as normalized cross-correlation, which is essentially like taking a template and sliding it across the image, looking for areas that are visually similar to, to, the, to either the, the, the tray or, or the railing. Once, that'll give us this kind of similarity score that will then threshold. As you can see, once we've done that, those, those red dots are kind of the places where it, it scored a high similarity. Once we've done that threshold process, we can, we can fit a line to it. So we'll actually do a line fitting algorithm. In this case, you can, there's a few things you can, you can use. This technique known as RANSAC. You can use um, Huffman encoding. Excuse me, not Huffman. Um, uh, but, uh, hu sorry, huff, de huff detection. Um, and so with that, you can find the set lines. And you can take the trays in the same way. And again, the point is now we have these kind of physical locations that we can tie to virtual points in our, in our physical pod recipe. Once we have that, we can then back project into the image the location of where the bins should be. And what you've seen here, what I've done in this image is those, each of those red boxes is actually calculated by, back, by taking that recipe that says, okay, bin you know, A5 should be you know, 50 centimeters from the ground and 30 centimeters from the left, left side of the pod. And so what we can do this, take that recipe and back project it in the image. And that will actually tell us whether we've matched up those bins right or not. And so each of those red, red squares is, is a prediction of where that bin should be in that image. And you can see it's done a pretty good job, right? It's, it's, it's identifying where they're at, and we're able to kind of identify those bins and then ex extract, them, extract them out. And then we'll, we'll play a, a final step. Uh, this, this transformation between the, the physical image and the pod image is called a homography, which means you now have a mathematical relationship between where those bins should be and the, and the image. You can see there's a, there's a perspective effect there. We, because we have the homography, we can also correct that and then warp those images so those bins appear as, we're looking, as if we're looking straight at them. And that's going to be important later on as we start applying the machine learning techniques because that's going to add more regularity to the appearance of, um, to the appearance of our bins. So then, the question was then, now we've got these bin images, how are we going to use computer vision to, sol to, uh, to get the answer we need? In other words, how are we going to find areas where the system has made mistakes, where, 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 the, where the physical inventory in that bin is incorrect? So one option is, is we looked at it and we said, well, could we just look at the bin and identify all the items in there, right? We could just look at the bin, we could say, hey, here's the, here's the six items that are supposed to be there, we find them all, and that would work great. Yeah, the problem is, is that's gonna be too hard, right? To do that, we'd have to have a visual model of every item in the fulfillment center. So we'd have to have a way of building visual models of millions of different items, maintaining them and storing them. At the time, the team was like three people, right? It, it was not going to be the kind of, it was, it was just gonna be out of scale. We weren't gonna be able to solve the problem that way. It was gonna be too hard. Um, and it was, it was just not going to be feasible. So then we looked at it and we said, well, how do we solve this problem already? Right? This is a problem we already solve. And how we solve this already is, is if we think there's a bin that has, a, has an error, we send somebody to that bin and we just have them count the number of items in the bin, kind of as a very fast filter. So they might go to this bin and they'll say, okay, there's supposed to be five items, uh, four items in the bin. They'll count the bin. It's okay, yep, I see four items. The bin's probably okay. You know, we'll keep looking for errors, errors elsewhere. So we said, well, can we, solve, can we solve the problem that way? And again, we looked at it and we said, oh, automatic counting, the, you know, this is Amazon, we sell millions of different items, some of them in plastic bags, everything's different, still seems too hard, all right? We, I don't, I, we don't think we can do that. So we said, what can we do instead? Well, we have these before and after shots. So let's use the before and after shots, right? So what we can do then is we, have the, we, have, we capture the shot before the person interacts with it, and we capture another shot on the way out. And so theoretically, then we should be able to be looking. We should be able to find the bins where people were should have things should have changed because someone was either adding or removing items. And then if they did something like take an item out and, and put it up, put up above like they were supposed to, then we should be able to pick that up, right? So it's kind of like a change detection problem. That felt that felt very feasible. So we looked at it and said, yeah, we think we can solve that problem. That seems like something we can do reliably at scale, and and go ahead and be able to to solve that. So. Um, our first attempt then, to do this then, we, we, have, a, we have a before and after, and so the, 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 the system was designed then to take a pair of images and decide whether 
an item had been added or removed to this pair of images, right? So the first step was we t we, the, the cameras would capture a pair of images. Those would, images would be flowed to a computer vision system, look at a pair and say, yes, an item was added or removed, did the inventory contents changed, or they did not. And again, for us, change meant an item, you know, either you put something in or you took something out. Once we had that, we could then correlate that with what was supposed to happen, and what we hoped was we'd be able to find this big string of defects that said, okay, you know, the person was supposed to touch bin 5A and 5B, but they also touched bin 3C, something happened, go check it, right? That's, that's the general idea. Or they were supposed to take something out of 5A, but 5A didn't change, and they took it out of, and something changed in 5B instead, so again, go check it, right? So we have these cases we can then funnel off and funnel back to the process. So, how we attack this problem, we tried a lot of stuff. We initially, you know, we did, we did the standard kind of computer vision recipes of uh, taking an image. Uh, there's there's some, uh, a computer vision, we have a term was known as feature transformations. Uh, and what this is, is the art of throwing away enough stuff that, that simple things like changes in, slight changes in lighting, things like that, don't look different. But you can still see differences in illumination. So if you're a computer vision person, uh, I'll throw out a few acronyms. We tried things like uh, histograms and gradients, SIFT, um, SIFT-like features. We didn't use SIFT itself. Um, but uh, we tried histogram gradients, uh, some of the various feature representations. We tried uh, matching the two images and kind of warping them to line them up together to kind of to, to, to detect whether th things were changing or not. But it turned out this idea, and often in computer vision, like the first thing you'll say is, okay, yeah, how hard could it be to look at two images and see if anything's changed, right? And the minute someone says, how hard could it be? The answer is really hard in almost every problem, okay? Even the simple ones, if, again, you look at it at scale over millions of images, and it turns out even the simple things end up really hard. So why was it hard? Again, our goal is just to look at these two pairs of images and say, did the contents of those images change or not? And if we're using human, yeah, you can solve this pretty easily, right? That's because you have, you know, ten, lots of years of, you know, 18 hours a day of walking around looking at stuff, okay? We were, we were trying to teach the computer to do the same thing. The big one was rolling pill bottles. Those rolling pill bottles drove us crazy, right? Like, uh, I mean, just, you know, and, and what makes a pill bottle, it's not just the shifting. We could handle shifting. If someone had to kind of move something back or forth, we had that nailed. It's that they shifted and they changed their appearance because you saw a different size of the label, right? And so the pill bottles drove us crazy. Um, things would flop back and forth. And so if you look at this middle right there, it looks like, I don't think you'll be able to see it on the screen. I can show you the slides if you're interested. But there's a, I just the mouse right here. There's a book right here. And what happens is, is as that pod moves, this book right here flops over to cover it. And so you can't see it anymore. So there's occlusions and there's, there's flopping back and forth. And the other thing that I think we didn't sufficiently account for as we we're thinking about it was, it's not, it's surprisingly how much illumination can vary. Now remember, this is a pod that travels about five feet from one camera to the other. Identical cameras, identical lighting, ident pretty much identical things, but because the angles are slightly different, especially when you have a lot of shiny things and we have a lot of stuff that's in shiny plastic, you can get very different lighting, right? So what you see here is that this is a set of uh, DVDs or CDs and the angles have changed just enough that now you're getting a very strong specular reflection off of the, uh, off of the shrink wrap in, in that second image. And again, you know, you, you, as you, at first blush, when you think about these things, you often think, well, you know, how different could it be? And, and the answer is, is, unfortunately, again, when you're running at large scale, it's not very hard to be quickly swamped in imagery that you're not expecting, right? Small lighting changes, um, small shifts in things, things like that. And, and so that really, you know, so, so, so it's been a long time, like, okay, you know, if we're gonna solve this problem by hand, you know, and how do we account for changes in specularity? So we try and get, you know, well, if we filter it this way, that'll kind of minimize the specularity. Or how do we find features that are robust to specularity? You know, for the rolling, we, this, that's where this, the, the matching came in effect. We were trying to match the two images and kind of warp them to, to, to align shifts. But we were struggling with it. And so, um, so we had this big insight. And the big insight was, uh, maybe it wasn't such a big insight, but at the time it, 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 it solved a lot of things for us which was, this is just a binary classification problem, right? You have two images that go in, one label that comes out. Did an item, did the contents change or not, right? Was an item added or removed or not? So he said, well, you know, this was, uh, at the time, uh, this was probably about a year and a half after the, the kind of breakthrough uh, deep learning paper had come out and kind of started, and you know, there was, people were really starting to explore the power of these things and some great tools were coming out. And I said, well, 
let's try this deep learning thing, okay? Why not? Let's, let's see if it could work. So I think this is the first th time when I, when I really realized the, kind of how computer vision is changing and the change in paradigm. So I did the dumbest thing I could, which was I downloaded the software and I said, okay, I don't think this is gonna work, but I gotta understand how the software works and make sure I can compile it and run it and everything. So I'm gonna do the dumbest thing possible just to see if the software works, and then I'll go ahead and like, you know, actually do this thing, do some real research and do this for real. So I said, okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take those two images, I'm gonna convert them to grayscale. I'm gonna make a new image by taking the, 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 the first image, the inbound image, right, the before image, put that in the red channel, right, so I'll take a grayscale image, put that in the red channel. I'll take the second image, put that in the blue channel, so I get this kind of weird looking purple image, right, so I've got my before and my after images, I've converted to grayscale, I've stuck them in there, and then I'll, uh, I have the single image, and I'll just put it in the neural network because, hey, it's already pre-configured. I didn't have to like, understand the package. I could just take one of the random you know, pre-configurations and just run it through there and just to see like, if the code compiled right and if I you know, understood how to tweak the parameters, okay? And, but the good thing is, is at this point, we had our hardware in the, in the fulfillment center for like six months. It was not hard to get hundreds of thousands of images. In this case, I, I grabbed like you know, a few tens of thousands. That was easy to get. And let's just try it, right? It's not gonna work. This'll, this'll, you know, we'll just try this. Except it did, right? And this is kind of what, what blew our minds. Um, I would almost, I joke that for the next couple of days I had an existential moment of why do I even show up to work anymore if it's this easy, right? And then the next thought was, well, how to make sure my manager doesn't know how easy it was, <laughs> right? So, um, and so, what, so this is an ROC curve. The best way to, uh, if you're not familiar with, uh, receiver operating characteristic curves. What you're seeing here is, is again, this system is a binary classification system, right? So we, the two things we're interested in is uh, false positive rates, right? So how many times did the system look at a pair of images and say, yeah, something changed when something hadn't? And the other one is the, is the detection rate, which is how many times when something had actually changed, did it, did it, um, did, were, were we able to correctly uh, find that? And so the ideal receiver operating ROC curve, you, sh you should see like a step function that comes up right up here at 100 and then goes flat over here. And so the farther it's sucked up, up into the left, the better, okay? Um, and how we got this data actually was, uh, the, the be beautiful thing about this problem is we got lots of data for free because we can just track what was actually supposed to happen. In most cases, the associates were doing the right thing. And so we could generate lots and lots of data of, okay, uh, we thought it changed, you know, was it supposed to have changed? And if we were really unsure, we could go back and look at it and verify. So this green line, like I said, so the farther it is up and to the left, the better the system is performing. This green line was our best hand-engineered model. And this was several months of work from like three different scientists. We had, a, we had an intern who was, uh, came from one of the best groups in the world on image matching, you know, really bright guy. Um, and, we, we, and we were feeling pretty good about that, right? So that simple thing that I kind of did one afternoon was the blue line, right? That's how much better it performed, right? And then when we kind of said, okay, that worked, let's do the next thing and just kind of start uh, trying a different neural network architecture. So, so this is, uh, the CDN was, the, uh, C, was, was the, the CIFAR. So if you're not familiar with the area, CIFAR was a test data set where they would, where they just want, this was in the early days where they're, they're just trying to experiment with how well could systems recognize images, like is it an image of a dog, of a cat, of a mountain? But we didn't have access to the, to the fast GPUs at the time. And so they were really small, like 100 by 100 images, because that way you could, you could solve that problem tractably. So uh, basically that network, the first thing you did is we took your, your image and you dance sample, sample it to 100 by 100, right? So again, that was part of the mind-blowing aspect to me was I took that image, you know, yes, it looked weird, and I, I, I threw away all the color information, you know, crammed it in here, and then I downsampled it to 100 by 100, right? Again, one of those things like this should not, well, there should not be enough visual resolution there to solve the problem. It still worked well. We then went up to um, a more advanced model. This was the model um, that was, the, uh, was often referred to as the CUDA confident model. This was one of the first models that won the ImageNet challenge, and it performed even better. All right, and then we kind of kept using more and more sophisticated models, getting better and better results. So that led to this processing pipeline then that for, for, for solving this problem, which is we'd start with a pod image, and that's just a whole image of the whole pod. We then would run um, the bin extraction, and that gives us a set of bin images. And these bins, these have been what we call rectified, so they look, they're warped as much as possible to look like we're looking straight at the bin. 
Then we run it through this defect detection. And all that defect detection is is a neural network that runs basically the same trick. Take the two images, kind of squash them together in a, in a, in a data representation, feed it through this network, and then get a probability of yes or no, did the item change or not. So some details of how we implemented this um, is, you know, and I'm happy to chat after in the question if you, if you have more questions. Um, but the initial step of, ex of, of pulling out the bin images was implemented with OpenCV in Python. Um, using C, and in some cases we did C++ extensions, uh, so we extended Python with C++ extensions where we needed speed. Um, the neural network is using CAFE. Uh, this was before Amazon has recently announced its sponsorship of, 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 excuse me, of MXNet. Uh, we'll be looking at that now. Um, it was trained on G2 instances, um, and, but in our case, we actually ran the network itself on, the C on CPUs in the uh, fulfillment center server rooms. And the reason for this was uh, at the rate we're generating images, we were capturing um, millions of images per day. We didn't have a large enough pipe between the fulfillment center and the cloud to be able to push all those images up there. So we had to run the, so we had to run the actual uh, neural network in the fulfillment center server room. Um, but our design was, and, but the, good, easy, the nice thing about that was our design was, um, was designed to kind of handle the throughput. Our problem space, we were allowed to have a bit of latency. So while we had to have pretty fast processing in order to keep up with the flow, it was okay if we had a few minutes of latency be between when we'd have to give an answer and we'd have to sort of provide data into the system to look for defects. And so our, so our actual overall architecture uh, really reflected that. So this is kind of a, a brief uh, over diagram. I'll kind of walk you through it. Um, kind of from a software stam standpoint, what happens is you have an edge device sitting out there on the fulfillment center floor. And that edge device is driving cameras. It's uh, noticing when pods roll up. It's handling all that image handling. At some point, it probably could do some basic image processing, but right now, it's really pretty much just, dr just driving those cameras. Then what we're going to do is we have, a, we, have a, we have a rack of servers in the fulfillment center. Um, the, that's, that's taking these pod, pod images. It's doing the bin image extraction, running the neural network, kind of collating the data, and then making that available uh, to the cloud. Then the kind of process data, the information about you know, where do the bin images um, you know, which, which, Im which images showed a change, which didn't, that then gets flowed into the cloud through a set of SNS and SQS queues, uh, systems and DynamoDB. So all the actual kind of process data then lives in the, cl in, in the cloud. We also have mechanisms where if we need to, if we need to fetch an image because say somebody, you know, we, we see an error and somebody, you know, and maybe in Seattle wants to take a look and figure out what's going on, we can kind of call back into the fulfillment center and pull those images out and view them. And then, and then well that, those then will feed, a combination of the two systems will then feed applications. We might want to ask for, you know, is, what's the probability there was a defect here? Uh, I'll talk about later. We have some other ways that we're looking, at, we're looking at these images. And so we put together this kind of software architecture that kind of runs all the way from the edge to the server room and up in the cloud. And, uh, you know, we got the architecture working. It was working great. We were able to get results. Um, and so problem solved, right? And the problem was actually, we looked back at it and we said, okay, that's great. Now let's wait for the stream of great results to come in. At that point, we almost failed. And the reason we almost failed was, it was there was a lot of reasons, but one of the big ones was, was that when we were doing before and after, we, were look, we, were, we had to see the defects occur at that moment. So if anything went wrong, if the camera forgot to fire, if you know, there was some stutter in timestamps, we couldn't quite correlate things, we lost data. And so the system, we were unable to find enough problems to justify the cost of the hardware. And so we had to go back to this slide. We had to say, okay, this before and after comparison, it was a great idea. It should have worked, but it didn't. So um, how are we gonna solve this problem? So we went back and we said, well, you know, desperation breeds innovation, right? Um, and so we looked at it and we said, well, I still don't think we can identify every item. I still don't think that's possible. But, you know, this neural network is way better. You know, we never thought it was gonna do change detection this well. Do you think we could count every item? Maybe we could, right? Um, so let's give that a shot. But this point, we have reason to believe we can be successful. Again, now at this point, the system's been running for six months, right? So 
we have millions of images. We can feed that neural network with as much imagery as it wants, right? Millions of images, no problem. Um, but, and now some of, this, some of this data isn't exactly correct, right? Because, you know, so, so we have lots of images with, with, you know, here's a picture of a bin, and we can go query the database and say, here's how many items are supposed to be in there. Yes, there are some problems, but that's okay. One of the things I think the research community has found about these neural networks is they're amazingly tolerant of small amounts of error in your training data. So that's okay. So let's just train a network to directly count bins, all right? And so, again, we use a convolutional neural network. In this case, we used an architecture known as uh, Google Net. This was uh, released by a research team um, about two years ago, I guess. Um, and so we used it in CAFE. And it really is, um, again, pretty simple. We take a raw bin image, we feed it through the neural network, and we come out with a probability map that says, here's the probability over the number of items um, in the bin, right? So how we're handling it right now is what we've seen is that there's a certain number of items where the bin becomes crowded enough that you can't see it. So we just treat it like a multi-class classifier. It says, tell me the probability there's one item in the bin, or zero items in the bin. Tell me the probability there's one, two, three, four, or say more, right? So that's five different class, or six different classes, right? Zero, one, two, three, four, and then more than four. And we can train the neural network very easily then to give us a probability of each of those numbers, correlate that with then what was what's supposed, the number of items that are supposed to be in the bin, and then use that to go looking for defects. And this was beneficial because it actually also mirrored the way that we solved the process manually very well. So it was very easy to kind of fit into our processes and, um, and, uh, and integrate with, with how we normally run things. So the great thing was is this saved the project, right? It, it hit the targets we needed. We went from, we increased, the, we, we found 10 times more inventory defects in a day the first time we turned it on and started running it for real than we used to find in a week, right? Just, just by doing it this way. It worked, it worked better with the business processes. It eliminated a lot of hardware because we didn't use before and after shots, so we could get rid of cameras, uh, which made the process more effective. Um, and it also taught us a lesson, which is, you know, um, even 10 years ago, like, you say, I'm going to solve this computer vision problem. You sit down and you focus on your algorithms, you know, come up with these really clever algorithms, and you come up with these, you know, ways of, you know, I'm going to do matching and, you know, project stuff in lower dimensional spaces and uh, you do Markov random fields, all this kind of fancy stuff, and you focus on algorithms. But with the power of these recognition machines now, with these deep neural networks, really the focus needs to change data, right? How can I get myself access to as much data as possible and just use the power of, the neural, of, these, of these networks? Because that seems to be the secret sauce that solves vision problems better than anything else. Uh, here's an example. And let me give you an example of how we did that, right? So we took the same data now, and we said, hey, you know, it'd be really nice if we could look at these bins and we could find some free space, right? Like we could, you know, we could maybe, you know, look to, maybe we could help find space more efficiently. Where we can get that data? Well, you know, we have some data on, on how big the items are, but, you know, where's, where's that space at, right? We don't have that, and the answer is we don't have that data, okay? But what we guessed was, well, maybe the neural network's smart enough if we just said, look, here's a really noisy, here's our best guess of how much bin data's in that bin. Um, we, want, we want you to, to learn to look at this image and predict that number. Right? So we're going to ask the neural network to just look at an image of a bin and say, yes, there are six square inches of space available in the front of that bin. Okay? And so we're going to take the image, we're going to run it through this big neural network, and we're going to have it predict this emptiness score, which is, say, percentage of space available or something like that. Now, that, the interesting thing is that emptiness score is noisy and it's probably wrong, right? Because, you know, we're guessing. We're guessing how much space is in there. We know it's wrong, but it's maybe approximately correct. And the crazy thing was, but, but why would this ever work? Well, this might work because we have, again, millions of images. We've posed this problem in a way that gets us access to lots and lots of data. I can pull any bin in that fulfillment center, an image of it, run this algorithm, and give you a, no, a, you know, a kind of an okay estimate of how much space is available. So I can generate loads of data to feed this network. And so what happens then is if you take that image, you, you, you predict the emptiness score, but you structure the neural network in a way that as it's doing its underlying computation, it has to kind of figure out where space is at. And you can do that by kind of mathematically structuring the bin the right way. 
And then if later on, so what you see here is we, is we grab some of those intermediate layers. We can then look at that and see where the neural network is trying to figure out where the space is at in its, in its process of trying to compute that emptiness score. And again, the crazy thing about that was, was that it worked, all right? Um, so what you see here in each of these boxes of images is an original bin image, and then this is what's called an activation map. How these, these, these networks work is, is they, do lo they do layers of processing, kind of mostly linear operations followed by a, a nonlinear uh, Tr uh, pixel-wise transformation, often a rectification or something like that. And so what happens then is, as, as, as you get farther up, they have these things called activation maps, which, which correlates with the idea of, if I think something's here that I'm interested in, then that pixel's gonna be, gonna be lit up. If not, it's gonna be dark. And so in this case, um, green means lit and red doesn't in that middle column. And then we can threshold that to make these kind of green and blue maps. Now again, I should emphasize, we never once told this system, hey, here's what an object is, right? I'm gonna segment it and tell you where it is. We just said, okay, this image on the upper left, that has 100% space open. This image in the middle right, we think it has 20% space open. And we just, that was a total guess just based on the dimensions and the, on the inventory of the item. But what we see is, is the network has learned, after looking at millions of images, to actually do a pretty good job. And so this threshold of green here is the areas that the network believes are empty space in the bin. And so it's been surprisingly accurate. We're still gathering kind of formalized data uh, uh, on it, but as we kind of looked at it, we would see it making some really remarkable choices. Um, one of my favorites is, is on some of these where you see uh, boxes here that you kind of see the side of the box. The network was surprisingly good, started, got surprisingly good at guessing, oh, this is the side of a box. It's not actually on the front. So you can count this as empty space, right? Because you're kind of getting a sideways glance. We never gave it that information. But what we did do was we gave it lots of data on, on, this, on the score, right? So when, I, so when I made this comment kind of like focus on the data, it's can I find proxy problems that get me at the types of information that I want to solve, right? That, so I, can I get a proxy problem that I can train the network based on data that's easy for me to get or cheap for me to get, but then gets me information related to the hard problem that I really want to solve instead? So related to this uh, with the bins, if this is, again, kind of similar problems on some experiment with, uh, we, are we are releasing a data set. It's, uh, we have a preliminary version of the data set now, the full data set of uh, over 500,000 images will be available. So actually, this, this bin image data, we're now releasing it um, to the academic community. It's part of the Amazon Web Services Open Dataset Program. Uh, if you Google uh, the Amazon bin image data set, or if you search for um, the Amazon Open Dataset Program, and, uh, AWS is hosting a number of kind of research data sets. Uh, we are releasing this data. And the reason we, looked, we released this was, you know, often one of the biggest obstacles to solving computer vision problems is access to these large amounts of data. One of the big problems is getting millions of images of data uh, of whatever you're looking at. So we really, if, if these kind of large scale, uh, weekly supervised problems are interesting to you, we are, we are making a data set available uh, that, that you can find. And so what, what I would say is for the takeaways of, of what we learned from this project was, was with the advent of this deep learning, you know, these really fast GPUs, these very sophisticated neural network models, we have really great generic pattern recognition machinery available now. Um, these, these systems just perform better than anything we've been able to hand engineer. Um, and it's really fundamentally changing how academic research works. And so with that, as I, as I mentioned before, I think there's still a room for clever algorithms, and, and, and you saw, especially as we had to kind of get the data um, rectified and, and organized in the right place, we had to be kind of clever in classic computer vision at that. But I think any time you approach a problem now, really the question you should be thinking about is, think about the data very carefully. How can I get lots of data? Is there a way that I can either you know, leverage open data sets, stick cameras in places where I can just stream data in? How can I get lots of it? How can I, what can I get for free? What kind of labels can I get without having to work very hard? I mean, worst case scenario, you can use Amazon Mechanical Turk. That's a great solution. Um, but you should think, you know, if, if, if you're gonna label, then how can I label it? How can I make my labeling task as easy as possible? How much labeling do you really need? And many of these, many of these systems will work very well with what we call weekly supervised or semi-supervised systems, where you take a small corpus of data that you label very carefully, and then just feed in a lot of data, feed in a lot of unlabeled data too. So how much, how much data do you really need? 
And also I would say, is there a proxy problem that you can solve, right? Just like that bin image problem. We said, look, we don't want to sit there and, you know, spend a month of our lives like highlighting here's where all the open space is in this bin, but we can ask the system to solve this problem of predicting this number that we can guess at with how much space is there. So can you solve a proxy problem instead that then that forces the that, that then forces the system to kind of perform the inference or reasoning that you need then to solve your to solve your ultimate problem. And so again, like I said, the, the algorithms are great, but really I would say the, the big progress will come when people start focusing on data. Um, and so with that, I would encourage you to focus on the data. Uh, I have a few minutes. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.